Something I'm sure everyone has considered, and almost all of you I'm sure have an opinion on, is where does CA's fantasy team go after Total Warhammer 3 is wrapped up? Now I should clarify, I have no doubt that their post-content team will be busy for a long, long while after the release of Total Warhammer 3. I mean, Total Warhammer 2 is already knocking on 4 years and we're still getting content for that, so I don't think it's completely unreasonable to expect the third game to have a content tale of at least 4 years, if not longer still. No, what I'm referring to is what game or series comes after we're completely wrapped up with the third game. We're going to take a look at almost every major option that I can think of, but what I really want to do is to get in-depth and detailed into each and every option. So today we're going to start with the most obvious one that I can think of. Wow. Now, just owing to the sheer gargantuan number of possibilities that lends itself to the war Total War series, I'm going to lay down some ground rules. No copies of existing strategy games, no setting that's so minor that doing so would lack a point, and nothing that requires too dramatic of a change from how Total Warhammer already plays. Now, that still leaves us with a ton of options, so we're going to take a look at quite a few of these a few times in the future, but today we're going to start with the big one. So the one most of the fan base has been asking for, and the one with the biggest opportunity for CA to just print money, Total War 40k. Now in case you're about to scream at me that there are already multiple strategy games in the 40k universe, dozens in fact, I think CA would be fulfilling a completely unique niche here. The only other games I can think of that really toyed with the idea of being a grand strategy in the 40k universe was the first Dawn of War's later two expansions. And given how badly Relic managed to bugger up that series towards the end, I'd argue they might as well be completely counted out at this point in time. The Dawn of War series is effectively dead in any way that matters. The only other one I can really think of would perhaps be Gladius, uh, the 4X game that just released uh, last year. Now, Gladius is a great game, and if you haven't tried it, it routinely goes on sale, and the devs are awesome, and they keep releasing great content for it. Amazing game. But it is firmly in the 4X camp with a fairly simplistic battle system and turn-based exclusive gameplay. Now imagine playing Total Warhammer where you could only auto-resolve battles and you can kind of understand why these two aren't totally competing with each other. So I genuinely think CA could be fulfilling a unique niche here and wouldn't really be stepping on anyone else's toes either. Now there's a long list of reasons to go in this direction, but money is by far the most obvious one. I mean, CA is a business after all. Now, Creative has made an absolute killing from Total Warhammer, no arguments there. However, Total Warhammer's fanbase is just a drop of water compared to the ocean that is 40k's. And it's not even just initial sales that would go nuts either, basically any DLC release they did would earn CAA and Sega the kind of money that most games don't even earn in their entirety, let alone DLCs. I meant what I said, I mean with the 40k license this would unquestionably become CA's most profitable game in history and would probably go on to become one of Sega's most profitable games as well. On top of that too, there's also a lot of crossover between the fan bases. There's not a lot of Warhammer Fantasy players who would turn up their nose or look down upon 40k as an entrant, so it makes for a fairly safe investment from Sega's part too. You have to remember, making the Total Warhammer trilogy the first time around was an extremely risky investment and anyone arguing otherwise is just lying to themselves. Sega had to go in and pay for the rights to an expensive IP on a very niche entrant and then commit to making not one but three of those games, so they would have been on the hook for millions and millions of dollars if it all went sideways at launch. Now obviously that risk still paid off and a lot of players who had never picked up a Total War game before, which I'll be completely candid, describes me, are now heavily invested and will likely pick up any game that CA makes as long as it's in a universe we care about. The Venn diagram of players who played Total Warhammer and those who would pick up Total 40k is just one perfect circle. Speaking of Games Workshop love, I think it's pretty safe to say that Creative Assembly is now by far the strongest partner that GW now has, and has probably earned all their trust and then some. So while you might be thinking, I mean, so what, who cares, GW hawks their license to whoever asks, it matters because it opens up a lot of doors for CA that might not be open for every other developer. So 40k already has a number of core races in it. 26 as of the time of this video, and that's having already eliminated the numerous redundant Space Marine factions and factions that would be completely pointless for Total War, like the Adeptus Titanicus and Imperial slash Chaos Knights. For reference's sake, that's more than literally every single race from the first 
first two Total Warhammer games combined, as well as all their DLCs, and of those, two of those races were literally just created exclusively for the games. Just like Total Warhammer Fantasy, 40k has a ton of minor factions that could eventually be turned into their own distinct armies one day, so the DLC potential of the setting is mind-bogglingly large, but only if Games Workshop trusts you enough to actually have you go forth and make them their own race. Lastly, and while it might be a small point, it still allows CA to reuse some of the work they've already done off of Total Warhammer 1 and 2 and what's going to be in 3. Not much of it, mostly just demons and some of the beastmen stuff, but again, that's still something that they don't have to do a second time in the new game. And again, this ties really beautifully into the whole lack of risk thing that publishers like Sega absolutely would kill to get. It's not all lollipops and rainbows though, which I guess is appropriately grimdark for Warhammer. The big fly in the ointment so far is ranged combat. While there's certainly ranged combat in fantasy, even with black powder weapons, and there's still quite a lot of melee combat in 40k, the scale's still definitely swinging further to ranged combat in 40k, and the current engine isn't particularly strong at that so far. Personally, I don't think the issue is quite as bad as it's being made out to be. I mean, cover already exists in the fantasy games in the form of walls, your ranged units get protected by the crenelles, where they're able to fire back unabated. Normally, the ranged units firing at them unfortunately have to deal with the cover. However, the game also has a sort of negative cover in it in the form of water, and it wouldn't be particularly difficult to flip that around to add favorable positions on the battlefield. Again, I'm not trying to imply that putting a race like the Tau into the current engine would be an absolute cakewalk, but I also don't agree that it would need a complete rewrite from the ground up as I've, as I've heard others imply. It's not that severe. I also hear a lot about transports being an issue, but those too are also already in fantasy. The siege towers can take a squad within them without issue, and all that would need to change is the ability for a squad to fire out of them. The only other issue with transports that I can see is just one that we'd have to ignore, that being the squad size limits. Because CA is operating on extremely large scales, a direct one-to-one -one with a tabletop is never going to be an option anyways. It's the exact same situation we already have with Fantasy, so it really shouldn't get anyone too worked up. If you're unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, Squad sizes on the tabletop tended to max out around 20 units or less. 40k, just like Fantasy, the tabletop has far smaller unit counts than what the lore tells us they should actually have, because having to shuffle around hundreds of units in a squad would be an utterly terrible way to play a board game. I think just like Dawn of War, treating transports as one or two squads rather than individual unit counts would solve this issue completely. This is actually one example where CA might need to expand the engine a little bit, I, I will admit, that or remove transport from the roster completely if they're too hard to figure out. But again, I feel like 90% of the work is already done in the form of siege towers. The last issue to solve is going to be one of map scale. Do they go for a galactic scale and have huge empty spaces throughout the map? Do they condense it down to a single planet or system akin to the first Dawn of War game? This is going to be one that's going to be a compromise no matter what they do. Doing up an entire galaxy means for every planet there's going to be a frustrating amount of nothingness in between, and it'll basically require ship combat to fill the void. Understand that I don't mean the ships themselves firing, but rather an attacker trying to invade and take out the enemy ship while the defender, well, you know, defends. Basically picture siege battles in space. Uh, another cool thing this could do, however, is effectively turn every army into partially a horde faction, as they'd all logically need their ships to transport them around, as well as have recruitment options in between planets. The easier option would be to run things on a single planet or system, though that begins to look patently ridiculous when you have dozens of different armies clamoring over each other on such a small field, relatively speaking. So I'm not too too fond of this for something of Total Warhammer scale. This is, in my eyes, the actual only big issue CA faces, far more so than range combat or transports. But I do have faith they could be able to find a fun solution to this, especially if this is the only big roadblock standing in their way. Alright, so let's play pretend for a moment and say CA decides to make total 40k. How do I picture that looking? Well, just as with Fantasy, I think each game should be launching with four core races and a fifth being added as a pre-order bonus, because it's silly to try and get everything compressed down into one game. I mean, heck, even three games might be a bit aggressive for this particular setting. But in the meantime, we're just going to focus on the game one for now, and we can kind of ignore everything else. 
at launch, I'd make the first of the core races the poster boys that everyone's already tired of seeing, that being the Space Marines. I'd probably do their two main factions, being the Ultra Smurfs, led by Robo Girly Man, and the Blood Ravens, led by Gabriel Angelos, Thief Extraordinaire. Um, as with the tabletop, the Space Marines would be the jack of all trades, master of about 70% of them. They'd used a pretty balanced roster and would have more elite infantry compared to most of the other factions in the game. Next on my list would be the Orcs. Why, you might ask? Because the Orcs are utterly amazing, and because Game 1 with Fantasy launched with them for a reason. The Orcs would have two factions, one being the Goths, led by Gazgul Mag Urak Thraka, as well as the Blood Axes, led by Snickrop. Orcs would be your definition of organized chaos, with inaccurate but very powerful ranged weapons, and brutally powerful but again unskilled melee attacks. I'd also give them a mob rule attribute from the tabletop to really drive home their sort of green tide kind of mechanic. Thankfully, the last greenskin, up greenskin update to Total Warhammer itself already lends itself very, very well to the Orcs of 40k. For the third slot, I'm going to go with the Undivided Chaos Marines. I think it's important to have enough spike content in each of the games, and while the Demons and Chaos, as well as the Lost and the Damned, are both extremely interesting, I think both of them could be better used elsewhere, probably later into the life cycle of the games. So I'm going to go with the original Spiky Marines here. They'd play almost the exact same as the vanilla Space Marines, so I'm not going to go too, too in-depth into how they would be different, but again, just picture hilariously expensive elite units with low model counts. For leaders, they've got a couple options, but I'm going to literally pick the most obvious uh, undivided ones that I can think of. Perturabo leading the Iron Warriors, as well as Abaddon the Despoiler leading the Black Legion. Again, not too, too interesting. I'm not going to go too, too crazy with them, so let's just go straight to number four. The Eldar. You know them. They were the ones that seemed to be hilariously broken in that last 40k video game you played. Funny thing is, I don't even have to name a game. Chances are they were either gratuitously overpowered or gratuitously underpowered. Anyways, the Eldar being the fourth race would provide you your glass cannons for the settings and the ones that would reward microplay more than brute force. Eldrad, the D-bag of, you know, Craftworld Uthway, he would be their faction's leader, while Al Aladrios, holy Christ, that's a tough name, Aladrios Kalkassian <laughs> would lead Craftworld Altaic, which would just lead the pre-order bonus, and while there's a number of great options on the table, I think by far the easiest option to get the game just pumped out and out the door would be the Demons of Chaos, because you could effectively just use the entire designs, models, and animations from Total Warhammer Fantasy, and just dump them straight into Total War 40k. Anyways, that's my take on the whole affair with the possibility of 40k. While I don't discount that it would be a fairly difficult prospect, I think it is significantly easier than some folks are making it out to be, and it is nowhere near as impossible as others are suggesting. And as much as I would love to see 40k, it's not even the only option for CA's fantasy to venture out with after Total Warhammer 3. We're going to be taking a look at some of those options very soon, including one option I would actually like to see even more so than 40k. In the meantime, though, if you've stayed this far into the video, I just want to say thank you so much for watching all this way through, and I hope to see you all next time.